All right, thanks everybody for coming. Um, <coughs> my name is Russ Lindsay. I'm director of uh, solutions architecture for Stack Velocity, and uh, we're going to do a quick little conversation today about uh, getting your hardware ready for OpenStack. And uh, Sean? Uh, yeah, Sean O'Connor, uh, solutions architect for Marantis. So a couple quick things. Um, what we want to do is we want to you know go over the uh, Hardware planning, um, hardware management, and tools associated with getting ready for OpenStack, as well as um, you know, monitoring once you're deployed. So kind of a high-level approach to, uh, to the discussion. We're going to cover things um, not in enough detail to really, <laughs> to really cover every, any one of them as well as we probably should. But um, you know, what we're not going to be doing is we're not going to be getting into a deep dive about bare metal provisioning or um, you know, any, any uh, recommendations of particular tool chains or um, a recommendation of, you know, OEM versus ODM hardware. We're, uh, we're trying to do this strictly as informative as we can without uh, injecting any personal opinions or that kind of stuff. <coughs> so a couple of questions that uh, you want to talk, think about when you're planning your workloads is, uh, or planning your deployments is, you want to think about what your workload's going to be. Um, Biggest thing you can that is a factor in what your hardware setup looks like is is what you're going to do with it. So you want to really make sure that you've spent adequate time planning what resources are going to be necessary for for your hardware to to uh, to achieve your goals. So um, also budget is a big factor in that for most people. We've got um, you know you can spend as much or as little as you want on any particular hardware deployment, especially OpenStack. So just want to be cognizant of that. And then. Um, Deficient, or if you uh, if you care about efficiency, some people are you know green initiatives, or you've got limitations of power based on your data center location. So those are some things to think about. Also, um, we'll also cover open source tools, and then um, some of the pros and cons between um, open source and or I'm sorry, um, uh, cloud optimized or OEM style hardware versus o um, ODM OEM hardware. Excuse me. Um, So big thing about processors, um, gonna, again, we're going to cover these at a real high level, but selecting processors, um, biggest thing is, is think about what you're going to get for your budget. Um, you've, got, you've got a wide variety of processors uh, to choose from, a lot of number of cores available out there um, anywhere, you know, high-end core usage from a AMD um, is, is an option depending on if, you've, uh, if you don't care about uh, power consumption, it's a good way to go. Uh, but uh, most people are these days in the OpenStack world are settling into uh, Intel processors today. Um, and the, the big thing is, is to think about uh, your clock speed versus your core count. So if you are, if you're really, the biggest thing with OpenStack to me is how many cores you've got to work with. So typical recommendation from my standpoint is to choose maybe the lowest clock speed of a particular processor core range. So, you know, whatever, pick, pick a eight core processor and choose the lowest clock speed associated with that. Um, memory, we're going to just quickly touch on the fact that you really, you want to look at optimizing your memory. Memory is a key factor in the performance of OpenStack, um, maybe even more so than a lot of other, other applications. So you want to you know, take a look at your, <coughs> at your, um, at your memory count um, for what your VMs are going to need. Or, so if you basically, if you calculate out your cores and your, and your memory for each instance, um, figure out what your total amount of usage is for your machines, you want to make sure that you're running that at about 60% of your total memory capacity. You want to have that extra capacity to help your system operate efficiently because the last thing you want to do is starve your operating system. Um, if, you're, if you end up needing to use more memory for your operating systems um, and uh, underlying infrastructure than you have for your, for your core or for your, for your um, instances, essentially what you're going to end up doing is starving one of the other and having to start caching things to disk and it's going to hurt your performance a lot. Um, the other thing is just, y go ahead. I personally, yes, probably. That's uh, that's that's a common practice for some people to do. Um, it's 
It's dangerous because if you end up in a situation where you completely disable it, you, you know, the, it can be unpredictable if you end up, if you, if you didn't plan accordingly and you're, and you're over-utilizing. You want to add anything to that? I mean, it's kind of... No, that's about it. Um, and don't plan for oversubscription. Um, I know a lot of people recommend it. Um, smaller deployments of OpenStack, it's fine if you're, you're trying it out, you want to see what you can do with it. Um, but you know, if, if you're really looking at it to use it for a production environment, oversubscription can really, can really cripple you. If, um, you just, it, it's too unpredictable. Um, network card selection, I'm not going to really spend much time on this, but just make sure that when you're looking at network cards that they are com that their drivers are compatible with OpenStack. There's um, hardware, that, you know, things have improved a lot with OpenStack over the last few years. There's a, a lot of vendors are making drivers now, but, you know, you'll still run into things occasionally where it's not supported. So um, biggest thing is just make sure you check that out. Um, hard drive controllers is... It's a, it's kind of Pandora's box of questions, right? Do you, do you use RAID? Do you use HPA? Do you, uh, you know, how do, how do you manage your, <coughs> how do you manage your SSD um, caching? There's, there's a ton of things that can be covered here, but um, essentially, really, what I guess from my perspective, the key takeaway from this is, the only time I would ever use RAID in OpenStack, I'm going to make that blanket statement, is, um, is when you are mirroring your boot drives. Other than that, I would use uh, HBAs across the board for all my storage, whether it's you know in in the same server or it's attached through JBOD. Um, but you know, direct attach one to one ratio is, is by far the best performance ratio. Um, we'll take a look at hard drives for a second. Basically, the the key takeaway for hard drives is. Uh, you're, you're looking for, in most cases with OpenStack, you're looking for volume of storage. So um, as a mass, you know, for, for the, the mass storage portion of your deployments, I, I would stay with SATA. You know, stick with, uh, stick with SATA. SAS has got a little bit better performance, but it's really not as, co as important to you as, as, the, as the storage capacity that you get, kind of the bang for your buck out of your, out of your SATA drives. Um, you know, for, for performance increasing, you're better off to use more SSDs um, for caching purposes. You can do your journaling on SSDs and then you know, use that to write out to your storage media. Um, just as a kind of a rule of thumb, um, generally speaking, the rec recommendations we make is somewhere between um, one SSD for journaling to every four to seven drives of spinning disk. Um, you, you'll end up with a little bit better performance if you stay on the lower end of that, but the sweet spot on price is generally, you know, around six to one. Um, the last thing I've got on there is consumer grade versus enterprise grade. There's, there's a lot of discussion around this going on in, in the community on and off. Um, everybody thinks that you can go down to Best Buy and buy a bunch of drives and stick them in your machine and they'll work fine and, you know, and, and, you, know you can save a bunch of money that way. Well, it's true. You can, but there's a there's a big but associated with that, and that's per that's reliability. So if you're, you know, you've got a couple of machines in your back room that you're trying stuff out on, you know, you know, it's something that you can try and get away with probably. If you're deploying stuff at scale in a data center, even even at the rack level, the last thing you want to do is is do that and go have to be out there replacing drives on a constant basis. Um, one exception to that may be. Um, in the instance, if you are doing a lot of uh, a lot of reads and not necessarily a lot of writes, um, I have seen some studies that show decent performance out of switching to some um, consumer grade SSDs. Uh, you can get uh, you can get decent life out of them that way as long as you're not writing a lot and the performance is good. So, as a cost benefit ratio, it's it is an option. And then we're kind of going to get into the nitty gritty of what we really wanted to talk about today. And that's what does it really look like from a process standpoint to get your hardware deployed? Uh, there's some of these things are, the, everybody takes them for granted. Rack and stack and cabling is a prime example. You've got, um, you know, oh, you throw, throw your stuff in the rack and plug some cables in and, you know, you end up with a pile of spaghetti and sure it works as long as you don't ever have to maintain it. So big thing that you really want to think about is 
trying to make sure that when you're deploying stuff, whether you do it yourself, whether you do it through a service, um, there's a lot of companies out there who will do rack, rack integration services for you. Um, you want to make sure that when you're setting up your racks that everything is clearly labeled, easy to follow, and neatly organized. Uh, um, especially labeling your cables. You know, the, I can tell you from personal experience when you go into a look at somebody's rack and there's no labels on any of the cables and you're trying to track one end of one black cable in a bundle this big to where it goes on the switch on the other end, it's not a fun thing to try to do. So, you know, it's, it's something that you, you just want to pay attention and plan. Um, it's, it's not a hard thing to sit down and, and write it out, make a spreadsheet, plan where stuff's going and put a label on each end of the cable, even if it's just one on this end and one on that end and two on this end and two on that end, it makes your life a lot easier when it comes down to trying to maintain it. Um, I'm not really going to talk a lot about airflow, but this really comes into play, I think, more so if you're looking at um, trying to adopt a, a white box type technology versus an OEM technology. Um, OEMs have had a lot of time to plan, test, build machines to, you know, to suit a wide variety of use cases, and, and they've spent a lot of time optimizing and making sure that everything works properly. Um, when you go the other end of the spectrum, you kind of you kind of get all ends of the spectrum, right? You've got you've got people who've spent a lot of time planning, and have done a really good job about managing things like airflow. You've got people who haven't touched it at all, and you know you open the box and you see the bare motherboard, and there's no air ducts, there's no nothing. Um, so essentially, what I'm saying is just take a look at that, you know, open it up, at least make sure that you know on your first your first golden sample that you get from somebody that you've got an air duct, something looks like it's managing your airflow to help improve your performance and your cooling pro process. Otherwise, you can, you can leave a lot of money on the table, especially at the data center operation level. Um, and then really from a, from a deployment standpoint, firmware and BIOS um, management is a really big thing. And it's a thing that a lot of people get hung up on. Um, when, when you Set up OpenStack, you're setting it up on your laptop and a bunch of VMs. It's much different than when you're trying to do something at scale or you know, even with just a few machines um, at, you know, at the rack level. You've got to make sure that everything is configured the same every time. You've got to make sure that you've managed all of your drivers correctly, all of your, um, all of your firmware correctly, all of your BIOS settings correctly. Everything always has to match. If not, you can end up with a lot of, of unpredictable performance out of your machines and potentially chasing failures around in a circle trying to figure out what's different on this box versus that box. So um, there, there are some, well, now there really aren't. There's not a lot of good stuff out there for, for this process. There are some, there's some tools that are available to, to do provisioning and that sort of thing. But really what it comes down to is when you're, when you're originally laying out your layouts, your designs, you want to make sure that you, s you stabilize on versions. So if you pick version XYZ of your RAID controller's firmware, you need to make sure that every one of them has the same firmware on it. And it's not always cut and dry. You could order, you could order RAID controllers or NIC cards from a vendor, and you could get a shipment of 2,500 of them in, and it's all in the same huge crate, and 10 of them are different than, the, than these, and 20 of them are different than that. And so what you end up with is really a, a kind of a conundrum of trying to figure out how to make sure all that's managed. Um, in my experience, the best way to do that is as you're going through your process of provisioning and burn-in, um, just flash them. You, you can do one of two things. You can, do a, you can do a quick check to make sure that the version is right, or you can just do a blanket right. It doesn't really matter as long as, as, long as you make sure that you are verifying that those are the same on every machine. Um, and you know, keep, even if it's just a spreadsheet, keep track of it, make sure that it's always the same. And if you're buying machines from a particular vendor or through a, a particular systems integrator, make sure that they have that list and that they're following it. Um, you, you know, every time you need to be checking when stuff shows up at your location, you're verifying, you know, at least spot checking that whoever integrated your machines for you adjusted those firmware versions and things so that they're right. Um, BIOS is another big one for that. You know, there's a lot of people out there are still going through and manually changing BIOS on machines to try to make sure that everything matches up. It's not the right way to go. You'll, you'll end up Human error is, is the, the cause of a lot of people's woes. So 
you know, the best the best thing you can really do is just get your golden sample, get it set up, you know, dump a bin file off and flash that to every machine as it comes through when you're doing your process of testing and burning. It, if it'll just save you a bunch of headache. You'll know every one of them is always the same. And then um, that kind of brings me to the, the topic of burn-in, um, which is also an interesting subject that a lot of people struggle with and they're not quite sure um, what the right answer is. And the reason is is because there's as many options out there as there are people in the room. There's people do this stuff all different ways, all different methodologies. Um, my personal choice, if you're going to do it yourself, is to utilize open source tools. Um, you know, much like we're doing with the rest of our community, support those guys. Um, you know, Google released a great tool called Google Stress. It's now called Stress App Test. Um, does a really good job of stressing your your system, it, and and it dumps out a, a decent amount of log files. Tells you what went wrong, um, you know, at least at least gives you an, an insight into what's happening during that burn-in process while it's stressing all your equipment. And then um, from, a, from a hard drive perspective, there's, um, there's a number of things out there. FIO is my personal favorite, probably. It uh, allows you to <coughs> establish workloads or read-write to the machines. Um, again, it's an open source tool you can use to, to um, you know, configure each drive to write and read a particular amount for a prescribed period of time. Um, there's other ones out there, Thrash and some others. But you know, do do a little bit of research, dig around, see which one you like best. Um, but there are, there are a few things out there that are key. Um, biggest thing is the overall arcing test, which you know, which the Google Stress or Stress App test covers most of. And then you know key component testing. So you want to also do things with your network test uh, to make sure that you've got good connectivity um, across uh, between your machines. So um, let's see, Linpack. I don't know. You think of some others? Yeah. No, no stress out. <laughs> anyway, there's there's a lot of stuff out there. And if you guys have questions, feel free to reach out to me later, and I can get you a list. Um, and then. The last thing, probably most important thing to think about is managing your systems from um, from remote location. It's 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 one thing if you've got your machine sitting there in front of you and you can walk up to your console and you've got a keyboard and a mouse hooked up and you're able to sit down and work on some things. Um, that's generally not the case for most of us who are working things from a professional level. We've got a one rack or 10 racks or 100 racks or 1,000 racks in a data center somewhere. And those things are they're usually a long way from wherever you're sitting, right? So you've got you've to make sure ahead of time that you've got ways to deal with those machines from that remote location, whether that is um, you know, setting up a DHCP server with Pixie so that you can, you can load images, bootstrap things from a remote location, uh, whether it's uh, you know, static IPs and you're going to manage it all manually, there, there's a lot of ways to go about it, but the biggest thing is is make sure that you have addressed accessing those machines from a distance. The, you need to be able to, to get to the networks first where they're located, and then you need to be able to communicate with them. And that's where you can use tools like IPMI. Uh, IPMI tool is a primary uh, tool used in most of the large uh, data centers in the world today. It um, Anybody who's using a, uh, a, a non-proprietary system at least, it's uh, it's a standard that was established by Intel that can be used for both system monitoring um, and power management, fan speed control. There's a lot of different things you can do with it. Really, the, it's essentially it's your it's your out of band communication window into what's happening with your systems. So if you haven't started using IPMI, it's probably a good time to start if you're going to think about moving away from anything that's proprietary. It's a, it's a universally accepted protocol that's used on everything from Dell to HP to white box hardware. You can, you can use the same interface for everything, and it, uh, it really helps you solidify a platform across your entire organization that can be used no matter what brand of hardware you choose to, uh, choose to deploy. Um, the last thing on this list is really kind of uh, it's 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 becoming more important, and it's um, as as things like open compute hardware become available, um, 
there's there's a there's a trend towards optimizing hardware to remove cost of operations, and in doing that, some things are removed like video cards or you know and base level video off the motherboard stuff like that. So what you want to make sure is that you understand how to m how to communicate with those machines at the local server level. Um, if you walk up to a machine that doesn't have a, have any video capabilities at all, it's pretty hard to work on it when you're standing in front of it. So um, think about think about s uh, setting up your toolkit for either serial over LAN, where you can do remote management of the machines from another machine, a laptop, what have you, or or serial cable connections, just so that you've uh, you've got a process in place to to um, work on that if that's the kind of hardware you choose to adopt. And at that point, I'm going to hand it over to you. All right. Thanks, everybody. So again, I'm Sean O'Connor. Uh, uh, I'm going to take a look at two tools. Uh, like Russ was saying, there's really not a, m a magic bullet out there for managing um, those, f those four things, firmware, uh, BIOS, uh, RAID. Uh, those, you know, there's really not software-defined cabling, so we don't have to worry about that. But uh, so I'm looking at uh, Crowbar. And uh, we're going to look at the ironic uh, Python agent. So a little bit about Crowbar. Uh, it started version one by Dell as uh, an OpenStack installer. Uh, it was open sourced in 2011, and it's actually still maintained by SUSE. Uh, version two uh, was completely re-architected, uh, broader focus. So the idea was you could deploy heterogeneous operating systems, uh, you and, and you can install into uh, any hardware. Uh, with the idea that you would be able to update firmware, configure RAID, provision, and do all of those kind of tasks. Uh, Dell stopped active deployment in April of 2014, but it's still community maintained. Uh, if you guys are familiar with Rob Hirschfeld and his blog, he's been for a long time Mr. Crowbar at Dell, and uh, now he's kind of Mr. Crowbar on his own. Uh, and I would absolutely, if you want to dig deeper, uh, suggest his blog. I kind of look at it as an outside-in solution. So it's not really focused on OpenStack. It wants to be able to deploy OpenStack, Hadoop, uh, lots of uh, scale applications. Uh, and it wants to work with a variety of hardware. Uh, if you look at what it's doing today, it, it's somewhat of a limited matrix of hardware. It's still very Dell-centric. Uh, it takes advantage of a lot of the Dell uh, tools, uh, WS manuscripts, and et cetera. Uh, so here's a kind of a you know uh, logical architecture diagram. Uh, it's uh, a lot of the. The original uh, tools were, were built in Chef. Uh, you've got this concept of jigs where you can take other tools and shim them in, uh, so you can actually integrate with Puppet. Uh, and it also has uh, the script jig, which uh, SSH is in to do a lot of the hardware management uh, and, and operating system deployment. Uh, so the counterposition of that is, uh, is this ironic Python agent. Uh, so this was developed by Rackspace. Uh, they, uh, they did a really great session on it in Atlanta. Uh, and uh, again, they've done a, a lot of great blogs to, to dig deeper into it. Uh, so it's, uh, it's core of their, their on-metal project. Uh, what it does is it replaces the Pixie TFTP image with a, with a Python agent with an API. Uh, so um, we're actually going to set that in a second. Uh, it also has uh, an ironic Neutron plugin. Uh, so it's, uh, the goal of that is to actually be able to go out and uh, configure the physical switches. Uh, so a lot of those virtual concepts, plugging in ports, setting VLANs, term of pruning VLANs, et cetera, are covered by that. Uh, this is more of an inside-out solution. So it's, it's born and bred inside of an OpenStack integrated project. Uh, they're focused on a specific OCP platform. So they have a predictable hardware uh, footprint that they're deploying to. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's really somewhat more of a focused solution, but uh, it's very targeted. Uh, so what we have here, you can look at the, uh, it's actually easier to read over here than on the screen. So <laughs> you've got the ironic Pixie deploy driver on the left, and then you can see what the, uh, the Python agent is doing. Uh, so over on the left, you can see uh, you're doing uh, DHCP requests and TFTP across and, and deploying that image, uh, then connecting back over iSCSI and doing a DD copy to, to bring the, uh, to configure the image or to configure the uh, the bare metal server. Uh, so you're actually beginning provisioning at the very top. So they're taking that first uh, TFTP request and actually pushing uh, a boot image agent. Uh, and from there, they have HTTP. They've got uh, an IPixie interface. Uh, so they've got a lot less primitive tools. Uh, they've raised it up a level. They can do more uh, in the agent. Uh, and then from there, you. Uh, 
you actually can reduce some of those reboots. So instead of having to TFTP an image, wait for that to boot up, um, do some push the image and then reboot again, uh, you can actually do a lot more of that uh, in one reboot and then hand it off to your end user. Um, I don't know about you guys, my, uh, my servers, I've never said that they boot too quickly. So uh, being able to take that out is definitely a, a benefit. Uh, so moving off to compute and onto networking. Uh, so I talked to a lot of customers uh, who are coming into OpenStack and somewhat new to it. And uh, there's a lot of confusion about it. It's like there's a lot of networks. So uh, you know we've got uh, you got cluster management, you've got storage, uh, you know private networking, public networking, uh, Pixie networks. Uh, there's a IPMI networks. Uh, so you know how do we take care of all of that? How do we make sure everything's plumbed correctly? And uh, how do we verify that? So uh, we're not going to get real deep in the weeds on network design here. But uh, a couple of options you want to look at. Uh, are you doing layer 2 or layer 3 at the top of rack? Uh, layer 3, uh, definitely a great network design. Uh, but you need to consider that you may have a lot of services that are layer 2 adjacent, th or that are expecting layer 2 adjacency, and that you're wanting to spread those across racks. Uh, so you need to be able to consider how you're going to uh, be able to communicate with services between racks. Uh, so MLAG, multi-chassis lag, uh, you know, as far as getting away from spanning tree at top of rack, uh, you know, pretty much all of the switches in some form or fashion have a, a multi-chassis lag that, are, uh, that you can uh, bond ports between two upstream switches. Uh, equal cost multipathing in uh, L3, uh, you know, you've got a few different options whether you're doing L2 or L3, uh, OSPF or uh, or Trill, depending on your your switches. Uh, and then VLANs, are you going to be doing GRE? Are you going to be tagging all of these interfaces? And, uh, and what are those VLANs going to look like? How are you going to map those from the, uh, the virtual networks to the physical? Uh, which networks are you going to combine? Which ones are tagged? Which ones are not tagged? Uh, hint, Pixie's typically untagged. Uh, and then if you are doing bonding, how are you going to deal with that with, uh, with Pixie traffic? Are you going to bond it? Are you going to separate out the Pixie interface? Or do your switches support uh, some type of force up feature to, to be able to pick a primary interface? to Pixie boot off of. Uh, and then top of rack aggregation. Uh, so there's a leaf and spine architecture. Um, so instead of having two large core switches, actually, let's go ahead and come over to here. Uh, so here's you know kind of three pretty common network designs. Uh, on the left, you have a fully uh, layer two network with M lags. Uh, you've got your services distributed across all of your racks. You've got VLANs. Uh, and then you have two large core switches at the top. Uh, it's great for about a thousand, you know, in the thousands of nodes. You definitely will run into scaling issues. Uh, so, you know, you move to the to the right, and you've got a full layer three uh, equal cost multi pathing with uh, leaf spine switches. So you've got your top of racks, and you have all of those uh, distributed out to m multiple distributed con uh, aggregation switches at the top. Uh, again, your services are isolated by racks. Uh, so you can scale to ten thousand nodes, but again, you've got to consider how those services are. And then you can look at VXLAN. So now you, uh, you have the ability to run layer two over layer three. Uh, so now you can have your services sitting anywhere uh, and scale. Uh, uh, basically, uh, you get larger scaling, and then you also can get away from your service isolation by rack. Uh, so once, uh, once your nodes are up, how do you monitor your hardware nodes? Uh, Nagios is kind of the granddaddy in the open source space for this. Uh, version 1 was released in 1999, so uh, at this point it's fairly mature. Uh, it can run agentless or with an agent. Uh, most of the functionality is in the agent. Uh, so you've got a, a plugin architecture, so it's very extensible. So you've got plugins for, for database monitoring, application monitoring. Uh, you can configure network equipment with SNMP or, and monitor by, with SNMP. Uh, you've got uh, IPMI polling. Uh, and then you can feed all of that data into uh, display tools or graphing tools. Kind of the uh, the next generation, I mean, we're definitely not going to get into the religious debate about Zavix versus <laughs> Nagios. But uh, one thing I would say, uh, it's it's fairly mature. It's it's newer. Version 1 was 2004. Uh, it handles auto-discovery and auto-registration of your nodes. Uh, and it builds in aggregate graphing capability. Uh, it has a SQL DB backend, and it's uh, a little more resource-hungry. Than, uh, than Nagios. 
Uh, so next is log management. So all these hardware nodes are generating lots and lots of logs. Uh, how do we aggregate that and how do we act on it? Uh, so Splunk, again, uh, they kind of invented this space, so you have to mention them. Um, <laughs> their own marketing. Uh, they called it Google for your logs. So if you're not familiar, it grabs all of those logs, it indexes them, you can search through those logs. Uh, they have fi uh, an entire app infrastructure, so you can add uh, uh, application-aware uh, search and uh, functionality. Uh, they've released a SaaS version, uh, Splunk Storm, uh, but it's closed source, and uh, there is a pretty extreme or a pretty large cost that comes along with that. Uh, what a lot of our customers are looking at now, uh, an open source alternative to Splunk, is uh, the Elk Stack. So uh, that is a stack of three projects. Uh, Elasticsearch uh, does indexing and search. Uh, Logstash collects and manages all of the logs. And then the visualization is done with Kibana. Uh, any kind of real production or uh, deployment at scale, you want to separate each of those projects into uh, dedicated hardware, because they can be a little resource intensive. And that's what I've got on kind of the, the software tools to, to manage. Uh, I think we're about out of time as well. So uh, any questions? Uh, so we looked at Foreman. I, I see most all of the tools Foreman included have uh, have RAID and, and um, a, a lot of those functions on the roadmap. Uh, I didn't see where they have, like, it, where they have the tools actually developed at this point. Um, and that's why I left them off. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, our fuel product, a lot of them ha are looking at different things uh, in terms of you know, RAID, network verification, network configuration. Uh, it just tends to be something that is, is looking forward more than it's actually delivering it, at least on a limited set of hardware today. Yes? I, I didn't hear, what, what kind of platform? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I've seen the same thing where if you're managing Dell systems, you're going to use the Dell yep. BIOS tools, uh, HP, you're going to use the HP tools, um, and then the BIOS manufacturers as well between the different versions. Yeah. Uh, so I believe that they package, they take the actual packages and then they script do. them. So you have to actually build an update or, you know, a kind of a, a tool chain for each hardware type. Yep. Uh, and then they orchestrate around it. Yeah, that's something that we, ac we actually were having a conversation about this earlier today. Um, there's There still needs to be support from each individual vendor at this point for that. Because the problem is that you run into, and it's not necessarily a problem, but the the proprietary nature of it comes from the fact that you know, BIOS, for example, you might all start with an AMI BIOS, but then depending on what you're doing with your hardware, you may make customizations. In fact, you pretty much always make customizations to that BIOS to support what you're specifically trying to tune it to do. And so that can break the generic tool for, for being able to manage it. So what, what we were discussing is how um, <coughs> the, the Crowbar initiative, they're kind of working towards being able to have those tools all incorporated in one place. So they're going to work with the vendors to to work on each individual piece and be able to include it so that it's available to you seamlessly in the pro in the process. Yeah, I mean, in my opinion, I think having the tool set integrated with Ironic, it somewhat gets community focused on it and potentially could build like a, a back-end architecture or a plug-in architecture like, uh, like we see with Neutron and Sender and things like that and have the vendors, you know, kind of put it the onus on them and actually get them contributing and, and building those tools into a, a common platform. Not that I've seen. So, all right. Well, anything else? All right, great. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks. Appreciate you listening. And uh, let us know if you have any questions.